Hello and welcome to episode six of In Suspense, a brand new video podcast or vodcast for fans and writers of crime fiction. I'm Leslie Cara and my co-host is the delightful and charming Lauren North. Oh, thank you. Hello. <laughs> now, those of you watching us on YouTube may be wondering why I'm wearing my sunglasses. Um, I'm not going on holiday. I can't go on holiday because it's lockdown. Um, but I did have a procedure on my eyes on Monday. It's It was called, oh now let me think what it was called, bilateral selective laser trabeculoplasty or SLT for short. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a mouthful, yeah. And it's um, it, it, it's a treatment for glaucoma because I was diagnosed with a primary open angle glaucoma. So yes, it's all been all been a fun couple of weeks. Um, so that's that's. I mean, it's it all went well and it's fine. But my eyes are a little bit sensitive to light at the moment. So I'm just trying to protect them and to protect the viewers from my from my red eyes really so uh yeah so it's been a it's been a tricky couple of weeks because my dad's still poorly and um i've had this diagnosis and been running around looking after him and worrying about him and my mum as well so but here we are life life goes on and the show must go on yes so um last week we interviewed the exception exceptionally talented and thoroughly lovely SE Lines about, um, we talked about digital publishing, didn't we? Mm -hmm. and, and about her latest novel, her eighth novel, very impressive, called The Housewarming. And it was a really fascinating and honest um, discussion. So if you, if you have missed that one, then do tune in and have a listen or a watch, because I think you may find it very, very useful and very interesting. And um, so now, Laurie, gosh, can you believe that this is the last episode in season one? I can't yes. believe it, can you? No, I absolutely can't believe it. I really thought by this stage I wouldn't feel quite so nervous and feel like I was wittering on and talking too fast. But um, no, alas, I still feel exactly like that. Um, it has been such a huge learning curve um, and a fun one. And I know that you and I are both really grateful for all the support that we've had um, on social media and for those people who have tuned in fortnightly to hear us um, wittering and chatting. Um, we have just had such an amazing lineup of guests for series one and just so interesting our topics um, and we chatted on Saturday didn't we about um, our series two lineup uh, and I'm really excited about that that's happening in January and um, I just can't can't wait uh, yes. but before we jump ahead to series two we've got our last episode today um, and it's a really fascinating topic of um, creative writing courses um, which is something that I have always wanted to do, but have never got round to. Um, but from what everyone has said, it sounds like such a positive experience and one that can often be sort of a foot in the door to um, agents and publishers. So, yeah, I, I feel like I can start a little bit on it. Um, but what was your experience of creative writing courses, Leslie? Well, I, I did the Faber Academy writing a novel course and I absolutely loved it. I mean, I, I, I it was the first time I sort of really took myself seriously as a writer and met some wonderful people on it. And I, I absolutely loved it and would thoroughly recommend one. But I, I don't think they're essential to do by any means. Um, I think a lot of people and, and you certainly haven't missed out on doing one, Laurie, because you're already published. So, oh. you know, <laughs> You've got your foot well and truly in the door. I don't think yeah, you need... I'm right in there. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think a lot of people have the wrong idea about creative writing courses. And I think some people seem to think that they teach you to write mm. and they really don't. Um, you know, they, 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 they give you in, insight into the craft of writing. But I think most importantly, what you get out of them, what I got out of them is reader feedback you know there were 15 other people in my group and they all read your work and they all comment on it and critique it 
and of course you get the uh, very strong editorial input from your tutor. My tutor was um, a wonderful writer called Maggie G and um, she's a brilliant writer and, and brilliant editor as well and that was invaluable having someone like her pick my work apart and sort of you know and I, I, I always thought that I was sort of editing my own work quite well and that my writing was quite lean and sharp but she always sort of found places to cut <laughs> yeah. and she was absolutely right when I read it back with the cuts that she'd recommended um, it, it was so much better um, I, I, it always amuses me actually when I get um, reviews I don't know if you you know when you get a, a funny review on Amazon or Goodreads and someone says something like um, this I've got to read you this one because it just it creases me up it's not a very good review it's, oh. I think it was a one star and it was it was about the rumor and this person I won't name them has written apparently the writer's been on a creative writing course and that's what this is something you might write if you were on a creative writing course but that doesn't mean it should be published don't believe the hype or the blurb on the cover or the positive reviews this is mostly dreadful god help us all if she goes on another creative writing course oh my god Oh, that's so awful. It's horrible, oh, isn't it? This is a prime example of why not to read your reviews. I Absolutely. Yes, I mean, I laugh about that now. But yes, it wasn't a very nice one to wake up to. But I think that is a common sort of, um, you know, thing that people say, oh, yes, I can tell they've been on a creative writing course. And I always think, but how? Because well, Yeah, like you say, if they're not teaching you specifically to write, which I think is also... You said, you know, a lot of people make that mistake. And I certainly did as well, because in fact, I contacted you last year, didn't I? And said, oh, do you, what did you think of the Faber course? You know, is it something that would benefit me? Because I'd mm. quite like to do a course. And you were just like, no, you've written a book now. You've got your foot in the door. Don't, yeah. don't worry. Um, I mean, I, I think they're great and they're, they're fun. And you, you, you know, as I say, you have all this feedback and you meet industry professionals. Um, and if you can afford to do one and you want to do one, then I would thoroughly recommend them. But I don't think they're essential. You know, um, we'll, we'll probably talk about that more in, in the episode, won't we, that we're, we're, we're coming on to. But, um, you know, I, I don't think they're absolutely essential by any means. But um, but they're fun and they're they're worthwhile if if you can afford to do them because they're they're quite pricey, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And I had a quick look just before um, we've come on today. Um, and yeah, the Faber one where you sort of have face to face, you go to London. That's four thousand um, pounds. And there's an online version which is two thousand five hundred. Mm -hmm. um, the Curtis Brown ones are a little bit um, cheaper, depending on which whether you go for the three months or the six months, but they still range in price from about 1,500 to 2,500 pounds. And I think you're right. It, it, it's about taking yourself seriously enough to, that, to have that investment. And I think when I wanted to do one, um, the children were so young and my husband was working away five days a week. And I just, I didn't feel like I could one, justify the money or the time I think for it. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I missed, missed the boat completely. But um, like you say, I'm all right. So. You, you managed, didn't you? You got there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are pricey. And I I mean, I remember I had to take out an overdraft really to, to afford the fees. Um, I don't regret it at all because, um, you know, I, I, I think for me it was a great turning point. And I think that if, if you're struggling to sort of take yourself seriously or to, you know, to, to, to believe in yourself, then they can be a really worthwhile thing to do. If, if you know, for nothing less than sort of um, meeting other writers, really, and, and finding a tribe of people. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Because I still keep in touch with a lot of the people who were on my course and the tutors and, and that, you know, their support and help has been invaluable really so i you know i wouldn't i wouldn't ever put anyone off doing doing one far from it no. i would always recommend them but i wouldn't say if you can't afford it or you can't afford the time or the money then don't despair because that you know you can get there another way you don't yeah. need you don't yeah. need one yeah but um our guest today is um is also a creative writing um alumna i think it's alumna isn't it when oh, you're it? A... oh so that's great because i thought it was alumni so i would have embarrassed myself so that's... well no i mean i don't suppose either of us learnt latin i certainly <laughs> didn't at Molsham comprehensive or any language yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I think it's alumni is plural, alumna. Anyway, I'll, we'll leave the Latin for um, other people. Um, yes, yeah, so um, our, our guest this, this week is Karen Hamilton, who also did the Faber Academy course. So we can't wait to speak to Karen in a little while. So welcome, Karen Hamilton, to In Suspense. Uh, we're so grateful for you to um, you've given up your time to be here. So I'll start by um, saying a little bit about you, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so thank you Karen... so much for having me. Sorry, I'm, I'm very excited. Sorry, I jumped oh, in there. Oh, that's great. No, it's <laughs> brilliant. Um, so Karen, you are a recent graduate of the Faber Academy and now a Sunday Times bestseller with a debut novel, The Perfect Girlfriend, which was released in May 2018 and translated into multiple languages. Your second novel, The Last Wife, came out in hardback and ebook in June 2020 and in paperback on the it's out on paperback on the 10th of December, so it's not very long to wait. Not very long, um, no. I've got a copy behind me and I Thank can't you. wait to dive in. Um, I have been listened to an excerpt during the virtual noir at the bar that we both did. Uh, yeah, I'm really looking right. forward to reading it. Um, so Thank do you, you want to start by telling us a little bit about the novel? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, the Last Wife is the story of a woman named Marie. And Marie is a very loyal person. She likes to think of herself as a really good friend. And um, when her her closest friend who she's grown up with passes away Marie takes it upon herself um, to take over the life of her best friend she doesn't mean to to start off with but she just can't help herself because she knows there's no one who's quite as good as her who can who can step into that role but as she does so she gets more and more trapped within this life and she realizes that she didn't know her friend quite as well as she thought she did Wow. It's a, it's a great book, Karen. I read it, I think I read it, was it the end of last yes, year or the beginning you. of yes, this year? Thank you so much. And what I loved about it was that it, well, it was so twisted and every single character has a sort of dark side, don't they, and, and secrets. And um, I loved the sort of complex layers, the, the, all the different relationships. And uh, yeah, I, I absolutely loved Thank it. You. And I was I was wondering really what inspired you to write that book because I, I well, I was wondering whether you were one of these writers who come up with an idea and um, and immediately know what you're going to write, or whether you play around with different ideas and sort of um, work out what would what what would have legs really. I love that question because everyone does it differently, slightly differently, don't they? So it, it always really intrigues me how other how other people do it. Um, for me, it's it, a character comes to me. I don't have any idea of a story or, or what's going to happen. I just normally get an idea and. I'm always, I never really, really, really know whether to admit this, but I've admitted it now, so I, <laughs> I'll continue to do so. I get this feeling about a character when I think of something that some, something they really shouldn't do that. I think, no, no, that is so uncomfortable and so against what we all believe is right and true. And when I start to feel like that, then I, that's when I get really excited about the character and I think, okay, what are they going to do? How are they going to do it? And how are they going to justify what they do and that's what I really enjoy doing ju creating these characters who justify decisions that the rest of us would say if it was our friend really you really you're really going to do that and um and then the, the plot sort of develops around that I put them somewhere with with the last wife actually it was um I was joining I'm setting up a book group with a friend of mine in my village because I used to be cabin crew and I always wanted to be part of a book group but it wasn't possible because my my working patterns were very varied and so we decided to do this so I just googled book groups just to see if there was anything that people generally did and I got involved in reading all these stories about all these book groups that had gone wrong or or that were very sort of competitive or, or there was one woman who was too scared to leave I think she would moved house I don't know if it was just to do with the book group but she really felt entrapped and I just thought I had this image of Marie trying to join you know not only take over her friend's life but sort of also taking over her book group which seems like quite a personal thing mm. and it, it just grew from there really. Oh that's fascinating and I, I read somewhere that you have a real interest in psychotherapy and that you do yeah. something called is it characters characters on the couch yes, can you tell right, us a little yes. bit about that? 
Yeah, so it was actually um, a friend of mine, Nikki Cloak, who also writes under Phoebe Locke, who we having a chat one day. And um, she introduced me to the service as Characters on the Couch, which is run by a psychotherapist called um, Arabel Charloff. And she, I haven't pronounced the name properly, sorry, Arabel. <laughs> but, um, she um, also teaches at the Faber Academy. And Nikki said to me that she'd gone along and done it for her, her, her book, The Tall Man. And it just fascinated me. And I remember saying to Nikki, um, there's no way, absolutely no way that I can go along and be in character. I just, I just can't do it, you know, but I, I'm, I'm curious and I'd like to give it a try. And Nikki said to me, oh, you'll, you know, you'll be surprised. And um, I was like, okay. So, you know, off I went and I was all sort of getting, I was really, really, really nervous. But Arabelle's lovely and she's really put me at ease. And I got really, really into it. I was, I, you know, I believed I was this, person and I had all these bad thoughts and I did stop at one point because I was scared that she's going to call social services <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just I just want to you know I want to I just want to say I don't really 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 believe like that but what's so great about it is that it really does make you think um if this had happened like to me to my character however, however I want to think about it you know it is feasible that I would have these thought processes mm -hmm. and I would try and justify it. And, and yeah, and, and as you said, Leslie, I'm very fascinated by, by um, psychotherapy. And I just think it's a great way, considering what we all do and mm -hmm. what we all write. I don't know if it's the same for you two. It, it's just that real insight into characters that's so exciting. Yeah, it all just sounds so fascinating. I, I am really looking forward to um, your book, Karen. Um, I haven't got round to it just yet, but I, it's on Thank my you. list. Um, no, well, I've, I've got yours. I've got yours, and also because I've, 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 I've got Leslie. So <laughs> when, when I see you guys in real life, I'm going to get you to sign them because I'm, you know, we all can't wait for that, can we? We've no, been... no, we definitely all can't. Can't wait. wait. <laughs> um, I definitely love what you're saying about putting a characters in that uncomfortable situation, mm. and definitely like taking over someone's life in that way, just for even. To start with you're like why are you doing this yes so, yes like, please don't please yes. don't like, i quite often think when i'm writing like please don't do this because it's so not what we would do <laughs> no <laughs> that's what makes a great read isn't it when Catherine because in real life that happens as well you're like what are you doing so yes. but, yeah definitely. please don't please don't <laughs> yes um so you mentioned the Faber Academy already actually so um could you tell us um because that's our topic today creative writing um could you tell us uh, a little bit about um what made you sign up for the Faber course when you did um and why you chose that course over others like it yeah it's interesting isn't it because they've become they've, they've increased in popularity and when I was looking I realized that my flying career which I absolutely loved um was coming to an end i'd had my third son and it was getting harder and harder for me to go away it wasn't just childcare. i, I didn't feel comfortable because i did long haul um going away and um i'd always wanted to be a writer and i'd been dabbling i would say for a number of years and i i'd got to a point where i'd started going to literary festivals and i started to learn that you know it was a good idea to perhaps if, if you could um, get an agent or something to learn a tiny bit more about publishing. Because when I first started writing, I don't know if it's the same for you two, I had no idea, no idea. It, there's just this whole world that you start, I don't know if it's the same for you two, that you start to learn about. And it's interesting. And I'd got to a point, so um, I was, I, I, I was redundant. I, so I'd given up my job and I had a small amount of redundancy money. And um, I spoke to my husband about it and I thought about, what will I do and what will I retrain in? And um, I looked online. I was going to do an online course to start off with because I didn't think with childcare and everything that I would be able to do it. But then my in-laws said that they'd be able to help out when my husband wasn't around to, to, to take care of the kids. And it just felt like the right time to do it. So I was very fortunate to have this money because obviously it's a gamble. It's not like I was going to get a qualification as such. Um, so, you know, without the support of my family, I, I couldn't have done it. And, um, and I forgot to factor in the train fares as well, which is good because I got up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, the, you know, that all worked out. And um, I just remember it, it was fascinating just to be with like-minded people and, and, and to learn things that I'd never considered. 
and it was also I joined a local creative writing group um, before while I was still flying but to actually have my work critiqued by so many other people and that's when I started to realize as well if, if common themes come up that's the areas that need working on and that was fascinating for me. Yeah, that's what I found. I did the Faber Academy course as well. And uh, as you know, and, and it's that sort of having having that critique and having other people read your work. Um, that's the that's the main thing, isn't it? Getting yes. getting up readers to to actually and, and like minded readers, they don't have to be experts because anyone has a valid opinion on whether a book works or not. And so having 15 other people giving you yeah. their impressions of your work is just invaluable, isn't it? Yes. But, um, one yeah. one of the big selling points, I think, of those courses is the the chance to pitch your work to agents at the end. You know that sort of ceremony you have at the yeah. end, where you it's quite nerve wracking, isn't it? it? Was where really nerve wracking. Put your it? work to an audience of agents. I mean. And I know a lot of students do get their agents that way. It, that didn't happen for me that way. I had to wait quite a bit longer, you know, a couple, few years after the course. Um, is that how you got your agent from pitching at the at the event at the end? It is, yes, yes. I had um, tried um, to, to find an agent for years. And um, once I started to, to learn about it, and I'd gone to three festivals and I had one-to-one -one sessions mm. and... Mm. I'd been asked for a full manuscript a few times um, for a different book and that had never led to anywhere. And so, yes, um, my agent, uh, Sophie Lambert, wasn't there at the day, um, but it was nerve wracking. I remember doing that, but because of the piece that we all wrote in the anthology, I guess it was the same for you, Leslie. Um, I, I did hear back um, from Sophie and um, yes, yes. Yeah, so, so for me, um, the course was was a direct result of, of, of getting getting right. an agent that way. So no, I, I know it varies for different people, and I I know for some people, and we were warned before um, that it wasn't like just one shot and that was it. Which is mm -hmm. good to hear your experience as well, because it did feel like that a bit. You know, if I don't get this right, you know, yes. I don't know. Was it the same? Sort of? I did feel well. I, I I did sort of feel sort of um, a little bit disappointed, I suppose, when I didn't get agent interest at the end. Mm. Um, I don't know what I'd been imagining. <laughs> They'd be queuing up for me or anything. But it, and of course, I was writing something very different then. I was writing a a, a comic fiction um, comic novel, um, and it seemed to go down very well on the day. Um, but you know, they didn't queue up to. <laughs> represent me at the end and so I but I you know R Richard Skinner obviously and Maggie G had warned us um that 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 didn't mean it was the end it was only the beginning you know um Absolutely. and I I went went on and wrote a couple more novels and, and was successful eventually but uh, yeah so I think that's it's they're by no means a, a guarantee of, of instant success are they and that's not no. why people should do them people should do them because no. they love writing yeah Absolutely. And yeah, it's, it's good that you said that because when people ask me, I, I do say that I say, yes, that is how I was fortunate enough to, you know, to get my agent, but it, it wasn't, it's not the only way. And I do sort of try and stress that because you're very right, you know, you're right, you just don't know what's going to happen. And, yeah. you know, it's a, a lot about timing. I yeah, you wouldn't guess. want um, someone paying all that money and not really wanting to do the course purely because they thought it was their route to an agent. You can't yeah. buy an agent, can you? No. Yeah. Um, but what yeah. advice do you would you give to someone who's considering doing a creative writing course, Karen? I mean, for me, I don't know. Um, for me, definitely, I would say I mean, it was probably a good five, six, seven years after I've been trying writing, maybe even longer actually, I forget now, um, before I did this course. And I feel like it was the right time for me. I'd already tried to write. I think I'd already written two books at that stage. Um, I went along with the book that I um, couldn't get agent interest for because I thought, right, well, I'll try and figure out what it is that's wrong about it. And actually, um, on the first night of the course, Richard Skinner had said to us to experiment. So I, so I did, and I, it did actually end up writing the perfect girlfriend on, on that course. Right. Um, because I thought, well, okay, I'm here. I might as well make the most of it. But I feel that it was the right time for me. I feel that had I gone sooner, I still had a lot of learning to do on my own. 
Mm. Because the first book, because it was interesting to hear your experience as well, Leslie, about writing romantic comedy, because the first book I wrote, well, I say it was romantic comedy. I think it was. It probably wasn't. I've never been brave enough to read it, but <laughs> that was the that was the the route I was I was aiming for. I'm not sure if I achieved it or not, but that that was the aim. Um, and I think it's 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 spending time learning about what you actually do want to write and and what you feel comfortable with. And and I think when you're ready to spend the money or or the time or or the travel or, or whatever the sit whatever the situation is to perhaps do a course if that's what you decide is right for you it's i think you want to be in a position where you're ready to hear the, you know the good and the bad about your work I, and I, I think, think, um, sorry sorry <laughs> i think that's essential yeah mm. that's essential isn't it to I, I think you have to be able to take constructive criticism and yes. you'd be surprised you know how many people aren't ready for that yes. and yes. and i think you know you you absolutely have to know what's not working if you're ever going to improve or or, or, or be in with any kind of chance of getting your work work published um, we were talking earlier when Laurie and I before you came on about you know whether they give whether a creative writing course actually does give you an edge I'm not sure I mean I think they're great things to do if you can afford to do them mm. and they're fun and they are worthwhile and you do learn a lot I, I'm not sure whether they give you an edge or whether perhaps do agents take you more seriously if you've invested invested that you know that money in a course what what do you think do you think they do give you the edge it's hard to know. I think, um, again, I can only speak for myself. This is my personal experience. I think it gave me an edge because I do feel that I was at the right stage to learn and benefit from that. Um, it, I think for me, it gave me a confidence. It mm -hmm. gave me permission to, I don't know if permission is the right word, actually. I can't think of a better one at the moment, but it just gave me that confidence um, to believe that, okay, I'm not just sitting away on my own hoping and dreaming because I, you know, to start off when I first started writing, I didn't tell anyone because I didn't, you know, it was, it was a secret. And um, so this was like starting to open up to the fact that this is something I could take seriously. And I knew, you know, it, it made me understand. I mean, I, I think we all appreciate that, that, you know, there's going to be a lot of hard work you know that there's going to be a lot of um, rejection and, and, and ups and downs, but it's, it was building the foundations for me. And I think that just gave me a confidence um, yeah. that, that perhaps in my situation helped. I mean, again, I, I don't know. Um, that's just how I feel about doing the course. For me, it, it was a massive, a massive benefit. And I'm glad that, that I chose to do it. But, it I, but I agree with you, Leslie. We don't know, do we? And if, if, no. if you're not in a position to be able to do that, it, it would be disheartening, I think, to think that it was the only way. And um, I know, you know, I've heard, I've heard good things about doing it online and, and finding like-minded like people to share stuff with. Yes. Um, so yeah, it varies, I think doesn't it? I think if you, you know, if, if people are listening and want to do one, I think if you can't afford to do one of these courses, the next best thing you can do is join a writing group or start your own writing group and look, yeah. look for other people who are really serious about writing novels and getting published. Because ultimately, the most important thing you need is the critique, isn't it? And the, yes. the readers. So, you know, that uh, if, if you can't afford to do a course, then for goodness sake, join a writing group. That's what I would say anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't, it is certainly the case that you definitely don't need to do one. Um, and I'm I'm a prime example. And there are lots of courses that haven't. Um, I think yeah. it's like you say, it's such a great opportunity if you're ready and if you want to take it. Um, and it's really interesting what you were saying about um, um, the perfect girlfriend. Almost forgot the title of your first. Oh no, don't worry. I'm glad it's not just me that doesn't. <laughs> my head. I start saying um, names or things. I start to get a bit like, oh, please don't say it wrong. <laughs> not have like that idea or was the idea there when you w went to the first lesson of the course or was it something that you sort of you hadn't started writing it then before the course I had started writing oh. it actually but I was very intent on getting this book that I've never got published I was sort of focused solely on that so I'd started writing the perfect girlfriend um 
in the third person. So I think I can't actually remember, but I think maybe I'd written maybe a third, a quarter oh, okay. of it. But I knew that this character wasn't a very nice person. And my children were very young at the time. So my life was very um, wheels on the bus. It was all very, uh, yeah, it was, it was very, it was a complete contrast to my, my personal life. So I think perhaps I didn't have the confidence to kind of go there and create a really awful character, you know, this, this very damaged, very, this character that people would be scared of and, and not like. And I remember on the course when we were talking about tents and um, I suddenly thought about perhaps trying to write the perfect girlfriend I mean, it wasn't called that then, but um, write this character, Juliet, who's the main character, the perfect girlfriend, in the first person. So I went off, and for my first presentation, which is what you do at the Faber Academy, you um, you present, I think it was about 3,000 words or something. Yes. So you, that, that's, that's when it's your turn. You, you present that to the rest of the group. And I decided to present this work. So I presented half in third person. And I rewrote the other half in first and I submitted both. because so I just thought, well, we'll see, you know, I'm here to experiment. I'm here to learn. Let's just see. And the feedback I got was unbelievable. Everybody said to me, and even some people contacted me before and said, I'm reading this and Juliet just comes alive. I'm getting goosebumps actually because I remember how kind and encouraging everyone was. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, that, you know, she comes alive in the first person and that was it. That's, that's kind of, you know for me and I think that's when I talk about the confidence you know that the fact that people weren't saying right we don't want anything to do with you anymore because really we, we, we meet in you and this person she's not very nice and that it was yeah it, it went from there so if that's something else I can say that I gained from the course it, it was that. Amazing um, and talking of books um, what are you reading at the moment Karen? You reading anything good? I'm reading something really good. I'm reading Ellie Griffith's The Stranger Diaries and it's Ooh. absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm nearly finished and it's brilliant. It's really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hooked, I'm hooked. Yeah. If I wasn't <laughs> working, I'd be sneaking a read in the day. <laughs> I love those kind of books. I've heard good things about that one. It's what about you, yeah. What are you reading? Well, I'm reading um... <laughs> really interesting Glaucoma, A Guide. No. <laughs> I, uh, the pace isn't brilliant in that one, but um, <laughs> of course, of course. Are you listening? It needs work, does it? On the phone, <laughs> but I've um, well, I, I've got this. This I haven't started just this yet. The Hit List by Holly. Is it Holly, Holly Seddon? Seddon? Yeah. And I can't wait to read that. I've been very behind in my reading because of everything that's going on, and I I keep talking about the Jigsaw Man, but I've also I am look at this proof cover. Isn't it brilliant? Look at this. It's got the actual. Oh, oh that's <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. So um these are the two that I really hope to have read by the end of November. I'm I'm gonna make sure that I've done those. So <laughs> what about me, you, Laurie? Well you make me feel bad because I could have given you show you the proof of what I'm reading and I've left it upstairs by my oh. bed. But I'm currently reading um, Simon, like <laughs> yeah, I'm reading Simon Koenig's um Kill a Stranger, um, which is just full of pace and intrigue. So I'm really enjoying it. And then I just got sent um Charlotte Duckworth's newest Wow. Oh, I love Charlotte's writing. Oh, I can't brilliant. wait to read that as well. Oh. Yeah, lots of exciting book posts coming in. It feels great because it's been in lockdown one. Um, there was no book post at all, was there? Well, there wasn't no. really. Um, mm. So, and it was quite a lot of digital proofs, which is still yeah. lovely. But I, um, I'm loving the little packages now through the door. Yeah, it's exciting to. Yeah, I'm glad it's not just me that's behind on on reading because I feel really bad. But it's just there's just so much isn't there at the moment and so yeah I'm, I'm hoping to catch up too so right so this is the we're at that point in the show where we like to ask a fun question and um now we know karen that you used to be an air steward yes. and you love traveling don't you yes um so it must be very difficult for you this year not being able to go away anywhere it's really strange um, <laughs> but we thought we'd go down the desert island discs route and ask what three things you could not live without if you were stranded on a desert island I think, I mean, it just has to be pen and paper for one, isn't it? I, I'd like to be like really excited, but it just has to be, doesn't it? Because there's no, there's no sort of getting around that. I suppose you could carve a bit, but, but yeah, I think so it'd have to be pen and paper and, or pencil and paper, so you could keep sharpening it maybe. <laughs> and um, photographs, photographs of children, I mean, I would say. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good answer. What about you, Laurie? No, I feel a bit bad that I've not mentioned my children in my list at all. Oh, no, 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 was that all chocolate? No, chocolate's right high up there, to be honest. (laughs) No, I've got um, a laptop, but if there's no electricity, it would have to be pen and paper. Um, Coffee machine. That's, yeah. And um, unlimited supply of Twixes was my my list. Do you know, Laurie, I knew you were going to say that, but I've, <laughs> I've actually said an inexhaustible supply of hula hoops because oh. I'm, I'm just obsessed with hula hoops at the Ooh. moment. I just can't get enough of them. Are you, is it, have you got a particular flavour? You... Just plain, oh. just plain hula hoops. I'm obsessed with them. Um, but yeah, I would like a wind-up radio because I love listening to the radio and, um, and I also would probably need my glasses as well or I wouldn't be able to see anything. So um, glasses, wind-up radio. I'm going to nick your pen and paper i didn't think of that crazily you know i'm a writer oh, well, let's, 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 but, let's uh, our laptops. <laughs> yeah i think yeah. you know and if it well i'm going beyond three if, if we if i could have a generator and a freezer packed with cold beer and mineral water that would also yeah, be good I, i'm not <laughs> sure you've quite got this stranded aspect yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so interesting um, so and now it's quick five questions which i've done on traveling for you as well oh, that's so, Karen, so are you ready yes we want just your first answer that comes to your head okay okay first one is backpacking or all-inclusive resort all-inclusive resort city or beach beach local cocktail or glass of wine glass of wine tent or b&b b&b suitcase full of books or a kindle Oh, in dark because of my eyesight. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Where do you go? Somewhere cold or hot? Uh, hot. Water sports or river cruise? River cruise. And finally, hustle and bustle or off the beaten track? Hustle and bustle. Yeah, well done. Very good. <laughs> That's um, brilliant. That's really clever. Oh, it's, it's a tricky one, the books one, isn't it? It always is because I read all ways, but yeah. Yeah, I often take, um, if I can remember holidays, I take us um, both, I think, because I like to yeah. have a Kindle knowing mm. that um, I've always got unlimited books that way. But there's something special about putting like that layer of books on top of all your clothes on in the suitcase. And then buying more in the airport just in case. <laughs> <laughs> oh karen thank you so much for being our wonderful guest today and thank you so much for having me i've really really enjoyed it thank you it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the last episode of season one oh wow yeah and um so so the last wife it's out in ebook now isn't it and it's due out in paperback on the 10th of december Right. So everybody, for goodness sake, buy a copy because it's fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And you've really given us some re- a really good insight into creative writing courses today. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, as Laurie said at the start of the show, we're so grateful to all the listeners and people who've been watching us on YouTube. It's been a great, um, you know, time doing this, hasn't it, Laurie? I yeah. mean, we- we've had such fun. Um, you know, I remember when it was just a twinkle in my glaucomic eye, this podcast, <laughs> and suddenly, you know, we're at the end of the first season. We've had some, a few mishaps, haven't we? We've forgotten our lines on occasions, forgotten what we were meant to say. Not that it's scripted. I don't mean we've got lines, but you know what I mean. We've forgotten yeah, no. what we're meant to be saying. We've had issues with technology because we're neither of us experts on anything to do with audio or <laughs> whatever. But, you know, it's been it's been great fun and we're so looking forward to the next season. And we've got a a really great lineup of guests, haven't we? Um, But as usual, we're not going to tell you who any of those guests are because we are going to keep you. Now, let's try and get it in in time today. (laughs) We are going to keep you in suspense. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.